The role of the chief information officer when it comes to customer experience is crucially important, but we don't talk about it enough. And today on CXO Talk, we're speaking with Michael Rutledge, the Chief Information Officer at Citizens Financial Group. When we talk about the role, your role of, as CIO and the role of IT in customer experience, can you give us kind of an, an overview of what's involved? Step one is really understanding the customer needs. And I think Citizens does a terrific job of listening for customers, you know, we bring customers in and, you know, they, they give us advice on our mobile app. We're constantly taking the pulse of our customers, both our retail customers and our commercial customers. And we measure that. Uh, we also use outside surveys, things like JD Powers, where, you know, we get an awful lot of data about customer sentiments. And that is really important. It's really important to me uh, as the head of IT, that I really understand what that customer sentiment is and how we can go about improving it. You know, one of the fundamental things when I joined the bank was stability. We weren't where we needed to be from a system stability perspective. And it's been a really maniacal focus of mine over the last four years, really improving that. And, and we've improved it by over 75%. And that, that's one of the first things I heard both from our internal colleagues and our customer base. Let's make sure that the systems that we are building are highly reliable, highly resilient, and uh, can withstand some of these bumps in the night that you get uh, occasionally. To me, the gap is that you're you're focused in IT on systems and reliability, and yet customers don't think about that. From a customer perspective, you know, if you go on the mobile app or the website, it just has to work. And so, so how, do you, how do you bridge that gap into really directly affecting customer perceptions? If you think about what's happened the last few years, you know, more and more customer expectation is that everything can be done through a mobile device. If you look at our own internal stats, you know, the, the, the number of people logging into our mobile application has increased over 22% year over year. The expectation is that people can do a lot more through their mobile device, whether paying a check-in, you know, they want to do it automatically through their mobile, you know, device, whether checking their balance. And, and it really has been really trying to move some of those, what we call, uh, you know, assisted transactions to more self-service, because really that's what our clients are really looking for. And to do that, it's really important that the systems are architected in such a way that you're able to remove the friction points from customers. And we've been very sensitive to that in how we're designing the experience of all of our digital applications. How much of this is technology and how much is understanding the nuances of what customers want? And then how do you how do you marry those two sides together? For example, one thing that's been phenomenally successful we rolled out was an easy way for our customers to make an appointment at a branch to check in give us information before they come to the branch about the type of services they're looking for. And then when they get to the branch, you know, they're having that tailored discussion that talks to, I want a mortgage, I want a home equity line, I'm looking for a car loan. You know, my, my uh, daughter or son are about to graduate high school and I'm looking for a student loan. So being able to t tailor those conversations is really, really important. And the feedback we've had from our customers there has been really phenomenal. You know, we've been in this journey to really transform all of our branches. So, you know, when you walk into a citizen's branch today, it's very different from what it was before. There's less tele, uh, you know, lines. There's more open spaces. You can walk in. You don't necessarily have to go to the line and put in your card in an Ingenico device. You, there's, there's, the, in many of our branches now, you know, our customer service reps have a tablet 
and you can do leverage e-signature to authenticate so we know it's you on that tablet without going to a teller line. So the response from our customers has been really, really positive to that. We're also seeing the same when I if I if I pivot a second and look at our commercial customers. Our commercial customers too want to move more to self-service capabilities. Once again, we're trying to make it very easy for them to log on to systems. We provided a, a single sign-on portal that allows them to log on once and then to access many of the different commercial applications that they need. We've introduced a digital but butler service where they can get curated answers to certain problems very, very easily. We've, we've updated our voice response systems to make it very easy for our customers to do business with us. And as I said earlier, we're constantly, we measure what's called NPS, which is the score that our customers give us, to both our commercial and our consumer uh, customers to make sure that we are, you know, on the right track. It's funny, as you were talking, I was thinking, you know, we're a commercial customer of Citizens Bank, and I haven't been into a branch in a, a long time because if I can do everything on my phone, of course, I prefer doing that. Everything, it's much easier. So, or, or on the website. So what are the, the technologies, you've kind of alluded to this, but what are the technologies that go into creating that kind of seamless customer experience that you're hoping for? A couple of examples of cloud native applications that we've, we've built from scratch that are actually where the, the customer feedback has been just, just phenomenal. So one is for our student business. We developed a loan origination and servicing platform from the ground up in just over a year. 8.5 million lines of code, API microservices architecture. But fundamentally, we really look to improve the customer experience. How can we, you know, we want to make sure that, that uh, our customers don't have to provide us paper documents. So how can we get that information? How can we leverage the data ecosystem with the appropriate, of course, uh, customer consent to go get that information? So we make it very easy for our customers to uh, enroll, to enroll either either do a, a student refi or get a new student loan. Uh, you know, and and the disbursement is very easy for those loans because we've really looked at the end to end process and made sure from a workflow perspective from origination all the way through to disbursement of the loan it's very easy for our customers to do business with us another example of that is one click heloc or fast heloc um you know a the, the the average processing time to process a home equity loan is something like 45 days We've been able to cut that down to seven days. And in fact, the application process now for existing customers can literally be done in three minutes. And the way that we've been able to do that is we leverage the power of data, the power of data that we already have for these customers to be able to pre-fill a lot of this information. We're able to do the underwriting automatically, leveraging data we already have. We don't have to go out and ask for this data, which clearly can take weeks uh, to do. So, you know, some of these systems have been really phenomenal. They've grown, uh, they're doubling the amount of uh, revenue that we've been able to get from some of these products year over year. Uh, and I think it's it's primarily because we've really focused on, on that customer experience and making it frictionless for our customers to uh, to do business with us. So you see a connection between the streamlining of those processes and the, the revenue and the customer satisfaction that you're receiving from your customers. We've seen it in the first, uh, I think, 160 days of launching lending as a service product. We were already over 1 billion in, in loan originations. You know, we saw, you know, a 40% improvement in loan turnaround. Uh, and it's really... As well as being a satisfier to the customer, it's also an enormous satisfier for our colleague base. They used to have to do a lot of these processes manually before. Literally, they would get a calculator out and calculate some of these things. 
it's we've made it so much easier for our colleagues who are sometimes on the phone, you know, providing advice um, by providing this end-to-end workflow. They can see everything from the beginning um, to the end, and and certainly the the, the satisfaction from our colleague base as well uh, has been uh, has been really really positive. There's a very strong link then between the the ease of use for your internal bank employees as well as ease of use from the customer perspective. And you need both sides in order to create that ultimate customer experience. That's correct. Absolutely. There's a very strong digital transformation theme that's running through this. Can you can you link for us or describe the, that connection between the digital transformation of these processes, all the things you're talking about, and customer experience? How, do, how, does, how does customer experience fit into the digital transformation landscape? Digital transformation and customer experience go hand in hand, you know? And, uh, you know, so I think, uh, and the key to a lot of this is, is the data. Uh, if you can provide, if you can make it a custom, you know, make it frictionless for your customers to do business by pre-filling information, by making it very easy for them to uh, complete applications. You know, they're able to start an application in a branch if they don't have time to finish it. They're able to continue that journey at home. So he's doing those type of things, leveraging the power that we have in terms of the data that we have to make it easy uh, for our uh, for our customers. And once again, you know, if I look at the client uh, the, the client facing side as well on the on the commercial business, you know, we, we've launched a digitization initiative to make it much easier to enhance client onboarding and our lending processes. You know, we've as I said earlier, we rolled out a, a single portal for them to log on to, which makes it very easy for them. And improves that that customer experience. We've improved our chat capabilities. So if they do need to speak to a client service representative, they can. And it, it really fits with, you know, really citizens is all about white glove treatment to our, uh, our our clients, and and that fits very well with that piece because we can do both. You know, we we really want to make sure that we're providing the self serve capabilities to our clients. They're able to, to do things themselves, but at the same time, if they need to reach out and talk to somebody, they can. And we try and make that, that process uh, very easy for them. Please hit the subscribe button at the bottom of our website, cxotalk.com, so you can subscribe to our newsletter and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Michael, from a technology standpoint, what kind of transformation or change or uh, evolution did you have to make internally within IT in order to enable all of this? We set out by developing a vision and a strategy. We called it the Next Generation Technology Strategy. And it had five pillars. One, the first was moving to an agile environment. How can we deliver much faster new capabilities for our customers? Second was, how could we build a library of reusable APIs, reusable microservices, so I can develop much more quickly and share capabilities, leverage open source, once again, with a view of being able to build so much more quickly. The third pillar was around our talent and really making sure we had the right engineering talent um, at the bank. Um, the fourth one was about our journey to the cloud. So, and we'll talk a little bit about that later, but you know, the, the, you know, the journey to the cloud is fundamental from two perspectives, one speed to market. And secondly, to reduce our operating costs. And then finally, the fifth pillar on this strategy was, uh, stability, cybersecurity, making sure the bank is protected. You know, we are a regulated entity. It's very important that as we're making all of these fundamental changes that we're, you know, we're, we're protecting our customers' data and that we're protecting the stability of, uh, of the environments. And uh, we're very focused on that. An interesting question that's come in from Twitter from Arsalan Khan, who's a regular listener and 
Arsalan, thanks for listening and for your great questions. And he says, given the importance that is attached to improved customer experiences, how do you decide the financial value of that? And who gets involved? Is it the CFO? Is it you as CIO? How do you, how do you figure out the value of customer experience to warrant that investment that you've been making? As we've moved to an agile journey, we've been very focused on OKRs and making sure that we understand the value of the investments. And we're very focused on iterative development, developing MVPs, testing and learning. Um, but you know, we have these quarterly uh, investments meetings where we look at all of the investments and we measure whether we're hitting the either the revenue targets, the operating expense targets, the customer experience targets. So we measure that. We report back on that on a quarterly basis. And sometimes we we make adjustments to those uh, to some of those investments you know so yeah we're very focused on looking at the value that these investments are, are giving us and, and and frankly moving to agile has allowed us to react much more quickly to that as, as i i said you know before we were doing releases that were 18 months two years sometimes three years what you know you spend an awful lot of money on a, you know a two or three year program to realize that hold on a minute this isn't this wasn't hitting the mark so now we're much more focused on smaller releases, incremental releases, and measuring the effectiveness of those releases on a, on a regular basis. That must have required a real shift in the culture, the mindset, the thinking inside IT, going from these very large monolithic waterfall projects to smaller incremental agile development. Not just a fundamental change for IT, but a fundamental change for the business, because the you know the business now has to develop the user stories in advance. They've got to get that backlog of user stories so the engineers can be developing at speed. They've got to think through you know what the business case is for these in advance. Uh, once again, smaller increments. Uh, and so, you know, that product owner role or experience owner role is vital. And we recognize that at, uh, at Citizens as well. And we've been on a journey to not only, I'd say, upskill and reskill our engineering talent, but also our business talent uh, to make sure they have that product management skill set. You raise a really important point, which is very often when it comes to these types of cultural changes, we talk about what's necessary for IT, but it also must be matched on the business side because if IT does not have the right environment in which to work, then the, the, the work is not gonna get done. One of the important shifts as part of our strategy was really getting the confidence of the business that, that we were able to deliver, we were able to deliver quickly at speed, and we had the right, frankly, engineering caliber that was able to deliver results. And, and we had some, some really good successes early on with that. I mean, things like, you know, the Small Business Administration's, you know, PPP program uh, after COVID really helped us, actually, because it forced us to work with the business very quickly to implement new capabilities so we could help our small businesses and our commercial customers get loans. We were able to develop some of those applications in-house with in-house engineers very, very quickly. We also, as I said earlier, we, we stabilized the environment very quickly as well, which gained the confidence um, of the business. We've been able to reduce the number of significant outages. We've been able to reduce the number of risks uh, in the environment considerably, the number of security vulnerabilities that were outstanding. So that's given the business a lot more confidence in the partnership uh, that we have with technologies. And, and, you know, I would say, you know, we started as a bit of an order taker, I would say, and, and didn't have that, that relationship. Now, if you had to ask the business what the relationship is, and we have, they would say it's completely turned around 360 degrees, and we have this phenomenal relationship. And certainly we can't do it without them. 
that partnership is really, really important. Can you assign any broad time frame for the change in that relationship from, as you said, being an order taker historically to a much closer partnership that you have right now? We turned the corner year two, I would say. I think uh, in terms of at least be having that that seat at the at the table. Um, but I would it's an it's an ongoing journey. You know, we're partnering with the business where we've been at this agile journey now about four or five years. Um, and you know, it is a, it is we're still learning. You know, and I think it's and the business is learning, we're learning. Uh, you know, we've we've fundamentally changed our operating model. Um, you know, we have we we moved to what we call the modern operating model which was done in parallel to the next generation technology, which fundamentally the business reorganized how they worked with technologies to deliver new capabilities. And, and we're still maturing that, you know, we're not, we're certainly not there yet. Um, but we've, we've, we've made significant strides uh, in the right direction. Again, it's a really interesting point that it's not just a technology transformation, but you have changed your operating model. I, I was I was going to say, can you assign, can you say that one is more important than the other? And I realized maybe that's kind of a, a silly question to even ask that. You need to do them in parallel and you can't be too far ahead with one or the other either. You have to do it in, in concert. I and mean, if I, you know, if I have an engineering team who is able to deliver at speed and deliver capabilities to market at speed, and yet the business is not able to keep up with the backlog of user stories, then at the end, we're not going to deliver that real true experience to our customers, that minimal viable product, because it's not going to have everything that the business need. So it's important you really keep them in, in tandem going at the at the same pace. And, uh, you know, yeah, I don't think one is more important than the other. I think it's vital, you, you know, you keep both moving along. And we have uh, another question again from Arslan Khan, who says, digital transformation is about business transformation. And the and he asks about the role of the CIO, since the CIO has this very unusual position of seeing across every part of the organization, which is which is very unusual. You're not you're not siloed as a CIO. One of the things we'll be moving towards is what we call a platform approach. And this is exactly to tackle this problem, which is, you know, I don't want to develop bespoke applications for every single business process that I have. You know, why do I need one application for student loan originations, one application for credit loan applications, one application for mortgage applications, one application or platform for home equity applications, loan originations. If I can build a set of common components that can be reused across all of them, it's going to be much you know, faster time to market and frankly, much cheaper to build out. So the, the lending as a service example that I gave earlier, you know, the 8.5 million lines of code that we, we developed cloud native application, We've built it so it can be reused not only for our student lending business, but for our personal loans, for our credit card loans, and different different platforms. So as the CIO, you're absolutely right. I can step back and take that platform approach and say, hold on, this is how we should architect this system and explain the benefits of that to the business. And sometimes you have to make you know, sometimes they will agree, and you'll you you can wait, and the uh, uh, you know, and sometimes you might have to go ahead, and because the business is it's such a priority to the business, you have to build a bespoke application or go out and buy a, a bespoke package. Um, so sometimes that happens, but making that conscious decision um, is really, really uh, is really important. The second piece of that is you know, which we've been on a journey as well, is to replace our for our core platform. So, you know, we have a legacy uh, core uh, and we've been modernizing that platform. We, you know, we've, we're actually moving to a cloud native modern banking platform. And once again, 
you know, that's based on these reusable building blocks. And as a CIO, it's up to me to articulate to our business how that can be leveraged across the broader business, not just for one particular business line. But I can, how can I use that not just for our consumer business, but also for our commercial business, for our small business business? So it's very, you know, I, I do have that unique vantage point and having taken this platform approach, building reusable building blocks that we can reuse across different business lines helps with that. How do you go to the business and say to the business, folks, we need to architect, well, pretty much everything. How do you begin that conversation? We did, and, and we have. And, and uh, you know, what we did was we set out creating a set of blueprints and roadmaps. And, you know, we laid that plan out. We, we you know, we said, look, Rome can't be built in a day, right? You're not going to be able to transform all of these platforms overnight. But we've touched in the last four years a great many of them. And we've made strides to improving them. But I think the fundamentally, the, the, the most important thing at first was setting out the architectural blueprints, acknowledging where you have platforms that are out of date, that need updating, prioritizing which are the ones that you need to upgrade first, and, and aligning that you know, with the business. It may be okay that you have a platform that's old if it's not a growing part of the business that is just working works every day, why touch it, right? So you just park that and you say, okay, we will put that in a maintain category, we will maintain it. But these other systems that are growth, that are gonna help us grow the bank, we will invest in. And that's what those blueprints do. And, and these blueprints fundamentally have to be done in partnership with the business where you lay out that roadmap to say, over time, over the next three to five years, is what we're focused on and, and get that alignment uh, with the business. It's really fundamental. At that time, how did you approach the business in terms of arguing uh, on the one hand about uh, the need from a technology standpoint versus on the other hand, arguing the need from a business standpoint? I think you've got to show both. Right, you've got to show what are the what are the short term, medium term, long term advantages to the business. Sometimes, sometimes there may be immediate benefits to implementing these small scale changes that can move the business forward. But sometimes you have to show that longer that longer vision and show that over time, here's how this is going to benefit you. If you look at, for example, the core modernization journey is a five year journey. We are you know, we've started it, but when we're not going to be, we're not going to move all of our existing products to this new cloud native platform until about 2027. But we laid out that roadmap for the business and showed them, look, we've launched now, we've, we've got all of our digital bank is now on this new platform, 80,000 customers in production, our savings account is on that platform. So I was able to launch that. Now, I'm building out checking capabilities by the end of the year, and then I can move our checking customers onto that platform, different products, one by one, for you know next year. So, you know, I think it's showing that journey, and but you've got to create business value along the way. It wouldn't have worked if I'd have gone to the business and said, "Well, in 2027, you're going to get a brand new shiny system, and uh, you know, um, uh, we, we'll be able to you know put things on it then." You've got to do it incrementally. You've got to show the value incrementally, uh, and that's that's what we're doing. We're, 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 I'd like to say we're biting the elephant, you know, one bite at a time. We're not trying to eat it uh, all at once. We're talking about the impact on customer experience, and so can you just again link for us all of this technology transformation, business transformation to that upper level theme of how does this help customer experience? If you look at our digital application, you know, we did 970 releases last year, 970 releases. So we were able to take that customer feedback and really incorporate changes rapidly into our mobile app. It has a 4.7 
uh, rating uh, on the App Store, which is you know is 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 pretty high. Um, and you know so you know by building component by building this component based architecture in the cloud, we're able to deliver new capabilities so much faster. We're able to react to industry trends as the banking industry has tackled fees. You know we were able to reduce our fees and and give customers who who you know if 24 hour grace period for uh you know an overdraft we're able to implement those capabilities very quickly we're able to implement capabilities such as you can now see your paycheck on a wednesday as opposed to a friday uh and once again we're able to deliver those capabilities very quickly on the digital platforms we wouldn't have been able to do that you know before i talked earlier about the branches you can walk into a branch that the, the the uh, branch personnel have a tablet and they can service you on that tablet. You don't have to go to the teller machine. We have e-signature uh, capabilities. So uh, there's many ways that we're making it very easier for our customers to do business with us. When you look at our the new new account origination for for new customers that sign up, we've really made it. You know, far fewer clicks to be able to do a lot of that information. Far fewer, far fewer details that they have to enter. You know, that's making it easier for our customers to do business. We've dramatically reduced uh, the time it takes to apply for a, a new checking account, uh, you know, or a new deposit account, or a new credit card by leveraging the power that we have in the data uh, here at Citizens. So I think the there's some examples, Michael. Chris Peterson asks, when you were talking earlier about building blocks, blueprints, and roadmaps, and this is a this is a pretty geeky question, so see, see how see how you how you'll respond to this. Did <laughs> that come from adopting or mature, maturing IT frameworks like TOGAF or ITIL? When you think about the standard set of APIs that we're building, you know, we leverage Bain, right? Which is the, you know, an institute that, that publishes standard APIs for the banking, uh, you know, the banking industry. Certainly from an architecture perspective, we follow, you know, TOGAF, um, you know, TOGAF principles. So we definitely look at them. When you look from a cyber perspective, we've built all the controls that the NIST Foundation um, recommends uh, in terms of cyber best practices and 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 building uh, protection into the code. So you know, yes, we definitely look at all these types of uh, outside uh, standards and and uh, where possible, we uh, we you know we adopt them. Absolutely. This is from Elizabeth Shaw, who says, "How do you know?" Which aspects of the customer experience, from the customer's point of view, needs improvement? And then how do you map that onto how IT can help? I'll give you one example. ATMs. You know, a couple of years ago, we had a lot of feedback on uh, the, about our customers' dissatisfaction with ATMs. Now we've jumped up this year to fourth in the, in the ranking in, in J.D. Power's on our ATMs and, and you know, we've introduced things like, you know, multi-denomination. So you, when you go to an ATM, you can ask for, do you want twenties? Do you want hundreds? How do you want your, your money? You can also enter personal preferences so that, uh, you know, next, next time you go, we automatically know that you always get $500 out and you always want it in hundreds. So, you know, there's those personal preferences. We've also made it easier if you, if you don't want to carry any card, and you can tap and go with your mobile device and get cash out uh, from many of our ATMs now with your mobile device. So, you know, direct feedback from our customers and we prioritize that set of uh, activity. And really, we've we've significantly improved, um, you know, the quality, I would say, for our customers of our of our network of 3000 plus uh, ATMs. Just one example. But, you know. We 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 always listen to our customers, and uh, you know we prioritize a lot of those those customer experiences that, that are raised. Another question from Twitter: Arsalan Khan 
comes Khan comes back again and he says, how is digital transformation different than any other IT project? And can you explain this from the perspective that uh, for a, that a non-IT person would understand? I'll give you one example that we've been doing as part of our digital transformation is what we call war on paper, right? So, you know, if you think about uh, in, in the, you know, the, the olden days, you know, if you need to prove your income, you have to fax us or walk into a branch and give us your payroll stub. Or if you're a company, you have to give us your tax information. Now, a lot of that information now is available through APIs that I can go get, right, with appropriate customer consent. So, you know, that's where the digital transformation really comes in of those business processes is, you know, um, how can I digitize that? Same in our commercial business. We really digitized a lot of the documents that our clients have to provide us in terms of wanting to request um, loans, et cetera. So we've been very focused on making that very easy for our clients to do everything to sign through DocuSign rather than signing, you know, manually and having to to post or fax or send that type of material in. So those are just a couple of examples. But, uh, you know, that, that war on paper, it not only is a big customer experience satisfier, it fundamentally as well reduces our operating expenses. If you think we don't have to keep all this paper, we don't have to post it and the postage fees that go with that. So you're also able to reduce your costs by uh, reducing the amount of paper that you have. So it's just one example of, of where digital transformation fundamentally uh, replaces some uh, you know, business processes. What about cloud? You've mentioned cloud several times. So where does the cloud fit into this and why is the cloud so important to this? Cloud is is fundamental to to our overall um, architecture. Um, you know, we we started. We have a multi cloud strategy, so we're on both AWS uh, and Microsoft uh, Azure. Um, we started on AWS, so a lot of the mobile applications that I talked about have all been built on uh, on on AWS. Our data platforms. You know, we had several appliance solutions. We were on Natiza, on Teradata, on IBM Big Insights, on Hortonworks. We've eliminated a lot of those appliance solutions. Now everything is in a data lake on AWS. We're able to build you know, customer 360, which is a, a view of all of our customers' relationships with us. We're able to have a product master. So we really understand fundamentally what are our, our, our customers and what products they use. So and we built all of that on the cloud. You know, we're moving to more real time uh, using data data streaming tools that enable us to make decisions real time. That's what our customers want. They want instant gratification, right? So, um, and all of that is enabled um, on the you know on the cloud. So, uh, and it's just fundamentally improved our time to market. So, you know, before you would have to order a server. And then you would have to order the operating system, then the database, then you would have to lay the application down on that. You know, we've automated a lot of that. We've automated a lot of the security control. So, you know, as I build out code uh, and I put it on this pipeline, you know, now I can do releases in under 15 minutes. It used to take four hours because it's all fully automated in the cloud. And I've built in the controls. I don't need someone in security to check the code, check out the code, look at the code and say, is it free of vulnerabilities? I already, I scan for that. I automatically scan for it. I produce, you know, I say, yep, yeah, that code can move forward into production. It's free of, of vulnerabilities, free of defects. So, you know, the cloud has helped us enable that. We've built uh, what we call a, a platform as a service, which is a sort of development toolkit for our engineers on the cloud, they're able to develop so much faster. Once again, reusable utilities. They don't have to do error handling. We already pre-built that and they can reuse that. They don't need to build logging. It's already reused and they can reuse that on the platform. So many of these capabilities allow our developers to really move at speed um, in the cloud. 
Um, it's also enabling us to really improve resiliency because we have multiple availability zones within the cloud. We have multiple regions. So we're able to fail over from one region to another region. And so it's really improved the availability of our most important tier one um, applications. And then finally, you know, cost. You know, ultimately our plan is to exit our data centers by uh, 2025, by the end of 2025. That unlocks a massive amount of operating expenses that we can feed back in to other things at the bank, either more development, more new capabilities, or other priorities for the bank. But unlocking that, and and you know, we, we see the cloud as as a much cheaper alternative to having our own brick and mortar and our own data centers. So again, there is this technology architecture that enables the agility and the responsiveness to customer needs, customer requests, which therefore improves customer experience, improves revenue, and all the good things associated with that. Absolutely. You brought it full circle, Michael. As we finish up, any closing thoughts on this alignment of IT with customer experience? The one piece of advice that I'd give is make sure you have the right talent. We, you know, we swung the pendulum a little too far over to outsourcing, I would say, you know, four or five years ago. And we've now swung that pendulum a little bit back. We've hired 550 software engineers at the bank. We've trained and reskilled over 400 software engineers by developing internal academies, badging certification programs. And, and our colleagues love it. They love the fact that we're investing in them, that they're able to use new technologies. These academies, they, they've learned 30 different new technologies, whether that's MongoDB or Snowflake or Postgres SQL, whether it's the new DevSecOps tooling that we've been able to bring in and you know new APIs, microservices. So, you know, they have this engineering muscle. They, they, people in technologies, they were computer science grads. They just lost that muscle. They were they were managing and not doing. And so, you know, we've we've now enabled them by reskilling them, retraining them to do again. And so I would say invest in your people, invest in your talent, train them uh, uh, would be, you know, one piece of advice. And then, you know, also look at the external marketplace, bring the right talent in so they can coach and mentor uh, your existing talent base as well. But that's that's fundamental. I would say get the get the talent right, and other things will fall uh, will fall in place. Great advice. Get the talent right, and other things will fall in place. And with that, we're out of time. And so I, I just want to say, Michael, thank you so much for taking your time to be with us today. Thank you, Michael. Everybody, thank you for watching, especially those folks who ask such excellent and insightful questions. Now, before you go, please hit the subscribe button at the bottom of our website, cxotalk.com, so you can subscribe to our newsletter and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Check out cxotalk.com and we will see you again next time. Have a great day, everybody.